Hey guys, what's up? Yeah, it's been, it's been a while, and I'm, I'm back for now, you know, like, I'm working on a big project right now, so don't expect to see me again for a little while, but I'm trying to bring awareness to something that is not very well perceived. It is well known, but it's not been put out as much as I would like it to. Um, kids are bullied throughout their entire life, and... I myself have experienced this, and I would just like to read something for a a vigil that I'm going to be a part of, that a very dear friend of mine is putting together, and she is a wonderful person for trying to bring awareness and help those who do not receive the care that they deserve. So, as the actor friend... <laughs> She has asked me to read this poem that you have probably heard. So I'm going to give you my rendition of the poetry to this day. When I was a kid, I used to think that pork chops and karate chops were the same thing. I thought they were both pork chops because my grandmother thought it was cute and because they were my favorite. She let me keep doing it. Not really a big deal. One day, before I realized fat kids are not designed to climb trees, I fell out of a tree and bruised the right side of my body. I didn't want to tell my grandmother about it because I was afraid I'd get in trouble for playing somewhere that I shouldn't have been. A few days later, the gym teacher noticed the bruise and I got sent to the principal's office. From there, I was sent to another small room where a really nice lady who asked me all kinds of questions about my life at home. I saw no reason to lie. As far as I was concerned, life was pretty good. I told her, whenever I'm sad, my grandmother gives me karate chops. This led to a full-scale investigation, and I was removed from the house for three days, until they finally decided to ask how I got the bruises. News of this little story quickly spread through the school, and I earned my first nickname, Porkchop. To this day, I hate pork chops. I'm not the only kid who grew up this way, surrounded by people who used to say that rhymes about sticks and stones as if broken bones hurt more than the names we got called, and we got called them all. So, crap, stupid computer. So we grew up believing no one would ever fall in love with us, that we'd be lonely forever that we'd never meet someone to make us feel like the sun was something they built for us in their tool shed. So broken heart strings bled the blues as we tried to empty ourselves so we would feel nothing. Don't tell me that hurts less than a broken bone, that, the, that an ingrown life is something surgeons can cut away, that there's no way for it to metal, metatize. It does. She was eight years old. Our first day of grade three, when she got called ugly, we both got moved to the back of the class so we would stop get bum getting bombarded by spitballs. But the school halls were a battleground where we found ourselves outnumbered day after wretched day. We used the stay inside for recess because outside was worse. Outside we'd have to rehearse running away and learn to stay still like status is giving no clues that we were there. In grade five they taped a sign to her desk that read beware of dog. To this day, despite a loving husband, she doesn't think she's beautiful because of a birthmark that takes up little less than half of her face. Kids used to say she looked like a wrong answer that someone tried to erase but couldn't quite get the job done, and they'll never understand. Then she's raising two kids whose definition of beauty begins with the word mom because they see her heart before they see her skin because she's only ever always been amazing. He was a broken branch, grafted onto the different family tree, adopted. Not because his parents opted for a different destiny. He was three when he became a mixed drink of one part left alone and two parts tragedy. Started therapy in eighth grade. He had a personality makeup of tests and pills. 
lived like the uphills more mountains and the downhills were cliffs. Four fifths suicidal, a tidal wave of antidepressants, and an adolescent of p being called Popper. One part because of the pills, 99 parts because of the cruelty. He tried to kill himself in grade 10 when a kid who could still go home to mom and dad had the audacity to tell him to get over it. As if depression is something that can be remedied by any of the contents found in a first aid kit. To this day, he is a stick of TNT lit from both ends, could describe to you in detail the way the sky bends in the moment before it was about to fall, and despite any army of friends who all call him an inspiration. He remains a conversation piece between people who can't understand. Sometimes becoming drug-free has less to do with addiction and more to do with sanity. We weren't the only kids who grew up this way. To this day, kids are still being called names. The classics were, hey stupid, hey spaz. Seems like every school has an arsenal of names getting updated every year. And if a kid breaks in a school and no one around chooses to hear, do they make a sound? Are they just the background noise of a soundtrack stuck in repeat? When people say things like, Kids can be cruel. Every school has a big top circus tent, and the pecking order went from acrobats to lion tamers, from clowns to carnies. And the I'm practicing. All of these were miles ahead of who we were. We were freaks, lobster claw boys, and bearded ladies, oddities, juggling depression and loneliness. Playing solitaire, spin the bottle, trying to kiss the wounded parts of ourselves and heal, but at night, while others slept, we kept walking on the tightrope it was practice on. Yes, some of us fell. But I want to tell them that all of this shit is just debris left over when we finally decide to smash all things we thought we used to be. And if you can't see anything beautiful about yourself, get a better mirror, look a little closer, stare a little longer, because there's something inside you that made you keep trying. Despite everyone who told you to quit, you built a cast around your broken heart and signed it yourself. You signed it they were wrong. Because maybe you didn't belong to a group or a clique. Maybe they decided to pick you last for basketball and or everything. Maybe you used to bring bruises and broken teeth to show didn't tell, but never told. Because how can you hold your ground if everyone around you wants to bury you beneath it? You have to believe that they were wrong. They have to be wrong. Why else would we still be here? We grew up learning to cheer for the underdog. Because we see ourselves in them. We stem from a root planted in belief that we are not what we are called. We are not abandoned cars stalled out and sitting empty on a highway. And if some way we are, don't worry. We only got out to walk and get gas. We were graduating members from the class of fuck off we made it. Not the faded echoes of voices crying out. Names will never hurt me. <laughs> of course, they did. But our lives will only ever continue to be a balancing act that has less to do with pain and more to do with beauty. Wow, okay, so that is a, um, I personally have not read that before. That is a very powerful piece written by Shane Kreisnack, I think is his name. Koisk, what? Koisan, Koisan, I'm going to go with Koisan. This guy has obviously dealt with a lot in his life, and I respect this man for writing something this top-notch. All right, so that is my rendition of that. Um, I'm glad that you were able to stop by and take a listen. <laughs> um, I'm working on another project right now to get this YouTube started again. So thanks for listening. And um, to any of you out there who get bullied a lot, um, I've been in your shoes. And if you can push through and you stick with your friends, you'll be all right. You're listening to a guy from experience telling you, you'll be okay. All right. That's all for me. Thanks, guys. See you next time.